Well, good morning, generations. We're so happy to be with you guys here this morning. Actually, last week, we got the opportunity to um, sing with a bunch of kids at our G Sports camp. It was about 200 students, and it was so awesome watching them worship our king watching them learn new melodies about who he is. And we get to do that again uh, this Sunday morning. So let's stand up. Let's sing praises to our King. Come on.
you're bigger than our circumstances. God, you're bigger than the battles we're walking through right now. God, I know there's a lot of us coming here with life dragging us down. But God, you are a healer. You are a father. You are a friend. God, and there's nothing you can't handle. There's nothing that you can't do. Lord, so as we get into the communion, as we get to represent who you are, let us remember what you've done for us in the past, to fill us with faith for the future. We love you. Amen. You all can have a seat. Well, amen. As you are sitting down, if you're joining us online, we are so honored that you are with us. This would be a time at home to grab some communion elements, whether that's uh, crackers or bread or juice. You can take this uh, time to grab those. And those of us in this room, if you could pull out the communion elements that you were given as you came in. And we just have an invitation for you. Uh, just like Jesus had an invitation for his disciples uh, the night that he took them to the upper room. And he invited them to partake in a meal. He invited them to be a part of a meal that would, for us, become a time that we would celebrate and remember and that we'd reflect upon what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so we just want to take a moment this morning to do just that. When Jesus had his disciples in the upper room, he used bread as a way to symbolize that his body was going to be broken. And he used juice as a way to symbolize that his blood was going to be shed. And all of that was done so you and I could experience new life you and I could experience the hope of salvation. And so together, let's take and eat of the cracker, of the bread, and let's remember and let's reflect. Let's take a few seconds upon the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Let's take and eat. And then the night uh, he was betrayed, he poured out the wine and for us the juice as a way to remember that his blood was shed on our behalf. And so let's take and drink and have a moment where we can reflect and remember what Jesus has done for us. Take and drink. Well, amen. Amen. Thank you for uh, being a part of our communion this morning. Well, I want to take this moment to welcome you to Generations Christian Church. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here 
And we are just so honored you are here. Whether you're in the room or you're gathering with us online, thank you so much. Just want to... Uh, ask you if you would, if you're joining us online or even if you're in this room to share the live feed of what's happening in our service. Just powerful things happen when we share that and we invite other people to be a part of it. If this is your very first time at Generations, thank you so much for being here. We are honored, met people this morning already. This is our first time. You've been joining us online for a while, but now you've decided to join us. <clears throat> and so we would love for you to take a second just to fill out the Let's Meet Connect card that's in front of your seats. Or you could do it online. You can just scan the QR code and then fill out the Let's Meet. When you do that, we want to make sure you have a free gift. So take that card to Next Steps. We'll give you a, a free gift and just give you more information. You've been coming to Generations for a while. You're like, I need to get connected. Fill out the Let's Connect card that's right in front of you or online. And I think the most important, if you need someone to pray for you or if there's something that, that you're going through that you want people to come alongside and pray, fill out the Let's Pray card. We have a team of people that pray over all of those prayer requests and will help uh, come alongside of you and pray. I have just a few announcements for you. Uh, the first is this. Uh, we have a couple more weeks left in our Pray, Give, Go campaign. It's been absolutely incredible to see so many people give on top of their uh, regular tithes and offerings. So many people come together in prayer. So many people unify to be able to help kids go to camp. And so this last week, we had hundreds of kids, teenagers and adults in our building and out of our building and all over our building for our G uh, Kids Sports Camp. It was absolutely incredible. Without your generosity, that's not able to happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. This week, we have best week ever for our middle schoolers. And students will be spending all week learning about Jesus and worshiping and having fun. And so it's just incredible. Next Sunday is a big Sunday for us. We start a brand new series. And it is Dad Fest. Dad Fest. It is Dad Fest. Yes. Yes. Five of us men are like, yes. It's Dad Fest. And here's why it's a big deal. Because we wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to invite people that maybe have been on the fence for a long time. But maybe uh, some of the, the, the cool features of Dad Fest would be able to just kind of entice them and be, uh, you know, a part of that. And so we have cool cars. We have games for dads and kids and families. We have so much more. We'll talk more about that. But we have these invite cards that are on your way out. Would you please grab a stack of them or maybe two? How many do I have in my pocket? Nope, that's just two. Uh, this week, you can use these as powerful tools. I was driving around. And I get a phone call from Johnny, our pastor, and he says, Jason, I need some Dad Fest cards. Could you help me out? And I said, sure, because I have some in my car in case there are people that I meet. So Johnny was getting his hair cut, uh, and so he needed to make sure he invited everybody that day in the haircut place. Now, I want to tell you that I walked into a very manly barber shop, like the manliest barber shop. I wish I could, but I can't because it was a salon uh, where he was getting his hair cut. No offense. I mean, I love it. I love it. But Johnny's sitting there, and there's like 20 people in there, and he's like, okay, great, the cards. Karen, you've got to invite your husband, and Susie, you've got, it was just the best moment. But it was just a great reminder for me that there are people in our lives every single day that we can invite. And this little card, this little card can actually pack some power as we invite people. So thank you for doing that. There'll be more information in your email online this week about Dad Fest. Thanks for being a part. Lastly, every single Sunday we have an opportunity where we can just experience giving uh, where we tithe and we give our offerings. And so you can do that in a couple different ways. You can, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321. You can give with cash and put them in the, the boxes in the, in the lobby. Or you can give online at generationcc.com. And when you do, when you do, people are connected to Jesus. And this last week, kids were connected with Jesus. And this week, teenagers will be connected with Jesus. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for giving. Let's pray. We'll ask for God's blessings. And then we're going to watch a recap so you can see exactly what happened at the G Sports Kids Camp. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time together. God, we just love you so much. We thank you for this time of worship to be able to be filled up. We thank you for this time of preaching that we'll be able to learn and grow in our faith. And we thank you for what you're doing in the lives of kids and teenagers and adults at Generations of Christian Church. God, would you please use this giving, this generosity to reach people for you and to connect them to Jesus. God, we thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen. Let's go!
I got to tell you, incredible week. I, I mean, I want to give a, a big thanks to all of the volunteers uh, that, that were here hanging out with kids. I literally saw some grown men that had like 15 toddlers on their head at one time, just <laughs> pounding them, right? Like, incredible, incredible week. And uh, we're so excited to be a part of a church that does, I, I, we believe what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, serve first. Before Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. Before Jesus said, do the work of my kingdom. Jesus served people first. And he still does that for you. One of the things that Jesus just might do for you is to give you freedom and life and salvation, the, his Holy Spirit in you. Jesus will serve you first before he says, hey, now you get to come and do this stuff in my kingdom. So as a church, we just want this community, even if they say, I'll never go to church, to say, but if I, if I were to ever go to church, I'd probably go to that one because I'm pretty sure they want me there. We want to be a church where you can belong uh, before you believe. So this week, we, we are diving into the last week of this series. Uh, that's what he said, looking at some outrageous claims that Jesus made. But I've got to tell you, as a church, uh, when, we, when we dive in the Dad Fest, I want you to know why we do some of the things we do. Because Dad Fest is a little crazy. We're going to have a barbecue fountain, people. Okay? A fountain of barbecue. Some of you are just thinking, like, what is that? Like, what do you, I want to experience, I want to lay in that. Some of you. A bacon tent? A bacon tent? It's just a tent you go in that is filled with bacon and a car show. One of the ladies at the salon had been trying to get her husband to come to church for a year. And she's like, wait a minute. He can bring his car and be a part of the car show? I'm like, we got him hooked. This is it. This is gonna work. We, you know, why, why do we, why do we do these things? Here's what we. I believe this. I believe that the people of God are the answer to the world's problems. And if we can just get people around it, they'll say, "This is so attractive. What is with you people?" I thought I was coming to a car show and I was gonna eat bacon, and now I'm like, I, I just want to be here. I want, I want to experience. So next week when you come, we have a presentation that dads are going to, you got a sports dad or a guy like that, you are going to want to be here because what they're going to say is, I didn't know church could be like that. That's what they're going to say. So we're real excited, guys. There's this, there's kind of like a contract that we have as, as a staff, me as a, a pastor with you. If you're not aware of this, here's the, here's the contract. When you bring someone to church, we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them every week. Because I, we, we don't know. We don't know who you're bringing. You're like, they're not going to come at Easter. They're not going to come at Christmas. Like, this is the week. This is the only week. So you show up. You're like, I hope this week. Yes, even if it's a giving series, which we do those every now and then. You know what? Jesus is all about. We will share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you need to know that you can count on us for that. Because I'll tell you what. If you're like my father, and I've always been a preacher for 50 years, half a century, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's here today in the front row with my wife. I'm a preacher like, like dad. You know what we preachers need? We need to hear the gospel. And so if you were drugged here today, if you're watching online because mom won't let you have breakfast unless you have church with her, <laughs> good mama. We all need the same thing. We just need to hear about who Jesus is what he's got for you, and he's got something for you. So I'm excited about Dad Fest, and i got to tell you, we're doing this series called Be the Church. And so on July 4th, we're going to be the church. We're not going to be meeting physically here. That's Sunday. We're not going to be here. Here's why. We want you to go and be the church in your neighborhoods in your apartment buildings, wherever you are. So we're going to be equipping you to do that. So I don't, I'm just, we're kind of getting the news out now. July the 4th, we're not coming. No, we're still going to have church. Just, we're not going to have it here. You're going to go and be the church, which is what I think Jesus would want, July the 4th. So we're just kind of getting that news out there so everyone knows. Now, that's what he said. Boldest claims of all time. We've been looking at some things that Jesus said that just some, sometimes we gloss over, sometimes we're confused, sometimes we can't believe that he was so bold to say it. I've been thinking this week, what are some of the claims throughout history, maybe even from our childhood or our folklore that we know like that was a bold claim? Because I kind of want you, I want to get you in the mood for like these bold claims. One of the first ones that came to my mind, and I wasn't alive when this happened, but I know about it. The Beatles, when John Lennon said, we are more popular than Jesus. 
I mean, when he's, it, that ticked a lot of people off. I don't think he was aware of how many people he was going to make mad. And I'm telling you, the Beatles were a big deal when they came in. But he said that was a very bold claim in 1966 in that interview. And I think John Lennon had no idea the ruckus he was going to stir up when he said we're more famous than Jesus. A very bold claim. Muhammad Ali, 22 years old, January of 1964, was going to fight Sonny Listen, and he said, I'm going to whoop them in eight. Ali was famous for these kind of poetic rhymes. And everyone was thinking, whoop them in eight. You're lucky to be in this fight. Turns out Ali would go on to become one of the greatest American boxers of all time. Probably one of my famous Americana quotes, though, because I'm an NFL guy. Some of you know where I'm going to go. Joe Namath, quarterback of the Jets, guaranteed a win by three touchdowns against the Baltimore Colts in the championship game that year. These are bold quotes, but I think all of us, there's another version of a bold quote that just gets on our nerves. It's, 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 it's one of these quotes, and you hear them all day, and you've become kind of desensitized. You've even become, I would say, a little bit angry. This is when products that someone's trying to sell you makes a quote. And USA Today, June 9th, 2020, they got sick of it too. And so they busted some people. Five hour energy. They allege the energy drink shots were more effective than coffees and doctors recommended it. Well, they were ordered to pay $4.3 million in penalties and fees. And I think I should get some of that because I've crushed some of those hoping to stay awake on the road. I'm destroying some dreams here. I'm sorry, but Cheerios. Some of you, like, don't do it with Cheerios. I want to believe the lie. I know you're saying that. Cheerios claim that the breakfast cereal would lower cholesterol. Well, the Federal Trade Commission um, made them take that off, and they can no longer uh, have a label that says they'll lower cholesterol because the facts don't prove it. Here's one, Airborne. We just came through a season of COVID. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but Airborne had to pay $23 million because they claimed it would stop stuff, and it doesn't stop much. Okay, so... Here's a, here's a favorite one of mine, 2014 Nissan Frontier. They had a video of the Frontier pushing uh, another truck up the hill. Here's the problem. If you bought that Frontier, it could barely go up the hill itself, okay? <laughs> Let alone, so, yeah, the Federal Trade Commission said, hey, take the video down, guys. Your truck doesn't do that, all right? This one made me laugh so hard. Frosted Mini Wheats, I'm a fan. Any Frosted Mini Wheat fans? In the, I appreciate the boldness from some of you. The rest of you are liars. You've had it. <laughs> this one, I laughed so hard. Um, Frosted Mini Wheats claimed, I can't believe this boldness, they claimed to improve children's attentiveness by 20%. Some of you are laughing before you hear the quote. I mean, look at the sugar on that. There's, there's no way you give that to kids, and kids are like, I'm 20% more attentive. They're 20% more off the walls. Yeah. Federal Trade Commission Center said, sorry, $4 million settlement to stop using that. Here's one. I'm going to pick on Jamie Lee Curtis. I can't believe I'm going to do it in public. Jamie, don't get mad at me, but you were a part of this. Activa yogurt. Dan, it's some of you ladies like, don't say it. Don't say it. No. They say that uh, it's scientifically proven that it will help regulate digestion and boost your immune system. Well, um, they paid $45 million uh, because it's just not completely and totally true. So some of you are like, he did not just pick on Jamie Lee Curtis. But I, I did because we get mad when people come and make bold, bold claims. Here's a bold claim that Jesus made. Jesus simply said this, I am God. He said it over and over again. He says it to you right now if you're watching online. He says it to all of us that are gathered here together physically. Jesus makes this bold claim. He says, understand this with your life. I, I'm not just from God. I'm not like God because of the things I do. I am God. John chapter 10 is just one of the places that records a moment that happens. And you know, I love the word of God. We are, I would describe us as a church that's a Bible church where we got, we go through and sometimes like verse by verse, because here's what's going on. God's drawing us a picture of a real moment on a real day. And he's saying, come into this day, feel the tension, feel what's going on in this moment. And this is an incredible moment because of what's happening here. I love to take us here all together. John chapter 10, verse 22, we get the setting. It says this, then came the festival of dedication 
at Jerusalem, and it was winter. Understand this. Pause, pause, pause. you got to know when this is. We call this Hanukkah, a.k.a. the festival of the lights. In Hebrew, the word actually here, this dedication, means renewal. i got to tell you what's going on. Jesus is here in this moment, and the people of Israel are celebrating the Maccabean Wars. Somewhere around the year 165, 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus drives out the Syrians. And at this time, there was no temple for God's people to come to and connect with God. They, they're not being able to observe uh, the Exodus and the Passover and the goodness that God has been to them for years and years and years. And so a great military victory happens because this guy says, Syrians, we're going to kick you out of town and we're going to rebuild the temple and there's going to be a renewal of the temple. We're going to light the candles in the temple. We're going to have sacrifice in the temple and we're going to connect to God. And so this was called, a lot of names, Festival of the Lights, and it's this renewal. Josephus actually writes this a historian from the first century about this. He says, from that time to the present, as Jews, we observe this festival, which we call the Festival of Lights, giving this name to it. And I think, he says this, I think from the fact that the right to worship appeared to us at a time when we had hardly dared to hope for it. I mean, Israel was down and there was this great war that happens and they're redeemed and they get to go back into the festival and light the candles. And so for 235 years, God's people have been celebrating Hanukkah. And we see right here that Jesus in verse 23 is going to be walking around. Jesus is celebrating this Jewish holiday. And it's just ironic because Jesus is there and here's what he knows. As we're all celebrating this 200-year-old victory while we're under domination from Rome. But we're all excited. Jesus knows this. I'm bringing a greater victory. Ever try to give someone some, some, some gift, some, something, and they're preoccupied with something, and you know it's just lesser than, right? But it doesn't matter. They're so fixated on, look at what I got. And you're like, I've just got something to give you that's so much better. Would you, would you use logic? With me right now? Logic? Verse 23, Jesus enters the scene. Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him were saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So you got some, some cues here. It's the month of Kislev which is the 25th day of that month, and it's winter time. They're celebrating Hanukkah, and it's festival in the city. So that means that, what, the city is full of people. Solomon's colonnade could have held up to 250,000 people, lording around, standing around, hanging out. It's just a place to be. It's on the mountain. Everyone came there. This, I'm going to tell you, this place is busy. Jesus starts to walk around what's known as Solomon's Porch, this big, massive area with ascending steps and staircases and places for speakers to stand. And the people shout out, and they say to him, we want to know as clear as day, just tell us. These hundreds, it could have been hundreds of thousands of people. Tell us plainly, are you the Messiah or not? This, this phrase, keeping us in suspense, it, it actually could be translated, just stop taking my life away, right? It's this idiom in the Greek, which was, this was written, and it's like, hey, would you stop wasting my life and just tell me already? Because Jesus has been in town, and you know what Jesus has been doing? Miracles. Jesus has been claiming to be the son of God. And they say, that's it. We just want to know. We're all gathered. Would you just tell us plainly, some of us, wherever you're at in here, it's okay for you to have a conversation with God and just say, Jesus, I want to know. Tell me plainly. Show me plainly. Are you the son of God or not? Some of us just haven't been bold enough to have that conversation with them and say, I want to know plainly, are you the son of God? And truth be told, you're kind of like these people here. You're like, you know what? Matter of fact, I'm sick and tired of waiting on an answer. I would like for you to just be very definitive in my life. Tell me plainly. Tell me plainly. Are you really Jesus? I would, I would say this, myself, you included. How are you asking Jesus that question? Because on this day, the word plainly, tell us plainly, it could also be translated publicly. 
Would you tell us publicly? Like, I dare you, Jesus, to say it in front of all of us because we're all here right now. And this is like the stakes are a little bit higher. It's like, it's that moment in school when someone and all the boys are gathered around and they say, what are you? Chicken, right? And it, it, you say that and there's a bunch of boys gathered around. It's just gonna escalate, okay? Someone's gonna get their tongue stuck to a light bulb, okay? That's what's gonna happen because if you just say it to one other guy in private, you'd be like, shut up, man. Like, you say it in front of a bunch of people and it's like, ooh. They're like, tell us publicly. How are you asking Jesus? Because there's this moment. We're in the book of John, John chapter 10. We just back up a couple of chapters. There's this guy named Nicodemus and he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night in private and he comes with this earnestness and he comes with this this kind of sincerity. And he's like, who are you? Because I see what you're doing and I need a Messiah. And I want to believe that you're the one son of God. But like, help me out, man. See, there's, there's different ways of coming to Jesus and saying, tell me plainly who you are. And I would just ask you this. What's your attitude and what's your heart when you stand in a conversation right now today we're there. And you ask Jesus in your heart and in your mind, who are you? Are you the Messiah or not? How are you asking him? I'd go back to this moment because they asked Jesus this question in verse 25. All these people there, Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. I told you, but you didn't believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they testify about me. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep, they listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Incredible moment. I mean, feel the tension. Everyone's like, are you chicken? Ooh. It's a show. Everyone, they're like popcorn. They're like, it's going to be great, right? They're selling popcorn. Everyone's quiet. They got their feet up. They're like, this is drama. This is the movies of the day. Jesus is the talk of town. There have been messiahs before him that claimed a lot of things, not messiahs that talked like he did. When he talked, he spoke with authority, and he freaked out all the religious rulers. The religious rulers are there. There's a crowd here. There's a massive amount of people. And you got to understand that there are some different terms that are used in this text. Jesus answers all of the crowd. Who's in the crowd? Well, there are people who just showed up for the holiday. Just a dad. And he's like, hey, kids, I saved some money. The festival is this weekend. And we're going to go to Jerusalem. You're going to see your cousins. You never get to see your cousins. It's going to be great. I'm going to take you up on the Temple Mount. You've never been, Billy. You're the youngest. We're going to go. We're going to light some candles. And it's, it's holiday. Right? And they're just there. And they start finding out there's this guy. And this guy's been healing people. What? I didn't see that on, on Instagram. Oh, my goodness. Like, I'm so disconnected. Right? I mean, that guy's there. And he really wants to know. Someone says, hey, tell us if you're the Messiah. And that guy's like, yeah. Yeah, are you? There's other people that are there that are Jewish religious leaders. I'm going to tell you, they've built a very comfortable life. And if Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to be out of a job and a comfortable life, and they don't want any of it. And there's some agitators and instigators in the crowd, a massive crowd. And when they say, Jesus, tell us who you are, Jesus' answer is, I did. I believe for a lot of us, Sometimes the way we ask the question matters and we say, Jesus, tell me in my life who you really are. And here's Jesus' answer to them then, to you and me now. Here's Jesus' answer. I have told you. I've been very consistent in telling you who I am and what I have to offer for you and how I can change your life and how I want to change your life. And here's what, here's what you're doing. You're not listening. Oh, you might be there. You might have heard it. You can repeat it. But the, the choices you're making in your life are very, they're very telling that you're not actually listening to what I'm saying to the question of, are you real? Are you the Messiah? Jesus tells them, he tells us many times, I did, but you didn't listen. So what proof do we have? 
Jesus points us right here in this verse. If you've got the app open on your phone, you can circle it on your app. If you've got a text in front of you, you can go home and circle it. I would circle it. Jesus says, look at this. The works, they testify. My father's, they testify. The works I do in my father's name testify about me. Verse 25. There's a, a man who's actually spoken at our church about five and a half years ago. His name is Lee Strobel. There's been a movie, maybe you've seen it. Lee Strobel's what we would call a skeptic. He married a, he married a Christian lady. And he loved her, but he, Lee Strobel did not love her faith. And he was, a, he was a bright guy, very educated. He was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And so he said, you know what? Babe, I love you, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my trade craft, what I do for a living, diving into facts. And I'm going to disprove the myth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead because I do not believe it. And so he set about, he set, he set about on his own free time, collecting facts and looking at what like a police officer would do or an investigative journalist would do, looking at eyewitness testimony, going and talking to doctors about the procedure, talking to people that have watched people die and all the details of the crucifixion. And over a period of time, Lee Strobel actually came to believe. He said, it would take more faith to not believe that Jesus rose from the dead than to look at the facts and say, this actually happened. He rose from the dead. He wrote a book called The Case for Faith. He's told us, his sheep believe. Non-believing sheep, they're not sheep, Jesus says. And so the question you should ask yourself in this moment right now, if you're saying, Jesus, are you the Messiah? He says to you, I've already told you and you didn't listen. Sheep believe. And you say, well, am I a sheep? Am I a sheep? Well, you got to believe. What is belief? What does God's word say about belief? Because that's such a crazy word for us. Like when someone says, I believe in something, I'm like, what does that mean to you? Like, like are you, you believe, you know, that the lightning are going to win the night? Like, I believe too, you know, but I've been disappointed in a couple games, right? Like, believe in God's word is described this way. Confident attitude towards God involving commitment to his will for one's life. Like, I, I'm, I'm married, Okay, I've been married for 24 years to uh, my high school sweetheart. She was my high school sweetheart. For her, I was a restraining order, right? <laughs> but I won. Uh, you creepers, though, don't be a creeper because that is creepy. It doesn't work out for everybody. Okay. Um, I'm married. And sometimes, you know, I'm like, hey, babe, we're going to do this thing. You know, and she's a good wife. She gives me support, but she also gives me a critical mind. And she's like, hey, that thing you're thinking about doing? Yeah, that's dumb. Don't do it. So I think about the patriarchs of the Bible. I think about Abraham. He was a real guy. He was married to a, a real wife. And he told his wife, hey, we're going to leave this town and we're just going to go out there. She's like, is there a Costco out there? Because there's a Costco here in the city of Ur, and my parents are here, and, you know, I've got friends here, and I've got Bridge Club on Tuesday night, and you're going to take me out there? What happens if we get out there and the God that is calling you out there is fake? Well, here's what Abraham said. Then when we get out there, we'll die. Some of you wives are like, yeah, I married that guy. I know. <laughs> I married, you're literally describing my husband, right? But, but get the, you know what God calls that? God calls that faith. Believing that he is who he says he is and living your life in such a way that his truths are confident and you don't care what the world says, you don't care what facts say. And God looks at Abraham and he says, you know what I can do? I'm gonna make you the father of many, many, many nations, of all kinds of people. And that's why we sing Father Abraham had many sons. Because God is good when we believe. What is belief? Making a commitment and making decisions in your life based on the fact that you believe that Jesus is real. That's what belief is. And Jesus says, those sheep, they're never going to be taken from him. And then he says, here's my final claim in verse 30. He says, me and the Father were one. So, verse 31, think about the crowd. 
This isn't like a bunch of guys in tuxedos and they're in, you know, like some English school, Oxford, and they're sitting around a campfire, you know, having their brandy and they're just having a comp. No, this is a, a mob that's getting ready to kill Jesus. And they're having this not very pleasant conversation. It's tense. And Jesus, in verse 31, faces opposition. His Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. This isn't the whole crowd. These are the people that have a very comfortable life and don't need Jesus to be the son of God. And so they pick up stones because of Jesus' claim and they're gonna kill Jesus. And Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Just think about this moment. Hundreds of thousands of people and Jesus says, I and the Father, we're tight. We're so tight, we're one person. These guys pick up stones like, we're gonna kill you. And Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. hey, before you kill me, little question. All the stuff I've been doing this week, like, which, which one of the miracles are you going to kill me for right now? They say this, verse 33, we're not stoning you for your good works. They replied, but for blasphemy, because you are a mere man, just a man, only a man, and you claim to be God. They heard very clear what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying this, I I'm God. The festival that you're doing here, the Hanukkah thing, guess what? It happened because I delivered you back then. I was a part of that. This whole festival, it's thanking me. You're welcome. Right? And they're like, who's this guy? I just met you last week. I've been doing Hanukkah my whole life. Let's kill him. You're not a man. You're, you're not God. You're just a man. This is the first time this official charge was given in this fourth gospel. Here's the, the last little bit, and I, I want you to keep in your mind just the tenseness of the moment. They're holding stones. They're getting ready to kill him. And Jesus, in verse 34, enters uh, an argument that is going to go straight to their hearts. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law that I have said you are gods? Lowercase g. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I'm God's son. I got to tell you, some of you, you read that and you're like, okay, I'm going to need a little help there. We're not going to skip over it because it's in this text. And God's word has got something for you. This has something for you here. And in this very moment, uh, I, I got to say, it's probably hard to argue about things of God with God's son. I'm just gonna say, like if you're gonna have this rabbinical argument and you're like, let's go get Jesus with logic and reason and the word of God, like you're probably gonna lose that, all right? Jesus, what he does here is actually known, it's a rabbinic kind of reasoning technique and tool. It's called lesser to greater. It's like, okay, let's have an argument about what, you, I know you got stones in your hands, hold it for a minute, right? You're getting ready to kill me. Can we have an adult conversation real quick? Because you guys know the word of God, right? Right? Jesus says, let's start small. You know that verse in Psalm 82, 6? Jesus was actually quoting it. And they would have known it immediately. And they're like, they're getting ready to stone him. I'm like, well, I know that verse, right? The verse, the whole thing reads, I say, you are God's sons of the most high, all of you. See, God gave his word to all the judges in the land, the rulers, the, those who know the law of God. And they were given the title lowercase God because of this quasi-divine function of exercising judgment. They are vehicles of the word of God. And Jesus says, hey, you're all lawyers and students of the word. And so you're gonna disperse judgment on God's people. So like you're God's right. And then he, he makes this, this turn. He says, hey, if, if you're kind of like using the word of God to, to, to give judgment, how much more so is it appropriate for me to say I'm the father when I'm not using the word to give judgment? Get this, Jesus says, I am the word. Like that's what I am. And he gives, it's not John who gives the side note. Jesus says, hey, by the way, you know that scripture can't be broken, right guys? Scripture can't be broken. I can't be broken. 
right? It's not crazy for, we're all lowercase g gods, but the difference between you guys who have to talk about the law and disperse judgment is I am the law and I come from the Father. Jesus ends it. And you keep it in your mind. They've got rocks. They're getting ready to kill him. And Jesus says, do not believe in me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. Believe the works that you may know. Believe the works that you may understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. They tried to get him. That's what it says in verse 39. But he escaped their grasp. He's gone. I believe what Jesus says in this moment with these guys. Everyone's watching. There's a small group of men that want to kill him because he threatens their comfortable lifestyle. And Jesus basically looks at them and he says this. You have all the information to make a decision about me right now. You have enough information, guys. Everyone that's watching, did you see what I did this week? I'm not just... I'm not just dispersing the word of God and teaching you as a famous rabbi. I am the word of God. How do you believe me? Believe the works I'm doing. Do you see the proof? Anyone can say the crazy things I'm saying. Who can say the crazy things I'm saying and then say, lame man, get up and walk. See, Jesus changed water into wine in John 2. This is why we preach the word of God, because I have enough proof. Do you have enough proof? Jesus cured the nobleman's son in John 4. He did a miraculous thing with an incredible catch of fish that could not have happened in Luke 5. Jesus cast out an unclean spirit in Mark 1. Jesus healed a leper in Mark 140. Jesus healed a centurion servant in Matthew 8. You know that they're still digging over in Israel, right? You go to Israel and you know what they're doing? They're digging everywhere. You know what they're not finding? Hey, report in the Herald today. I uh, just want to bust some news coverage. Jesus uh, did not turn water into wine. We found someone at the party and they said, it wasn't wine, it was a parlor trick. Haven't found it. You know what they keep finding? People who say this, I will go to my grave and you can kill me and you can take my worldly wealth and you can take anything from me. But I'm gonna tell you one thing for certain. I believe that Jesus is the Christ and the son of the living God. You know why? Because he healed the widow's son in Luke 7. Because he's healed, he still the storm in Matthew 8. He opened the eyes of two blind men in Matthew 9. He fed over 5,000 people in Matthew 14. He raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11. And he raised from the dead in Luke 24. Here's my question. Get this. What do you need? What do you need to finally start to believe and live your life like Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I love how this ends. Jesus just vanishes. They're going to kill him. He throws it. He's gone. It says this, here's how it ends. Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed. Many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. Get this line. Man, this gave me goosebumps this week. I love it. Verse 42. And in that place, Many believed in Jesus. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. You know why this place is just as significant as that place? Because the spirit of the living God is in this place. And are you someone that's not believed before and you're ready to say, I'm gonna believe. Could many believe in this place? Would you stand and sing? My friends, if you're ready to believe today, may you be one of the many who believe in the name of Jesus. Come on, church, let's sing it. Not for a moment have you forsaken us.
Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If God's been stirring in your heart and you need someone to pray for you, we'll have people down front who would love to pray for you. Again, if you've made a spiritual decision this morning, you've decided, okay, it is my time to confess my sins and trust in Jesus, or it is your time to take the obedient step of baptism, will you let us know that? You can do that on the Let's Pray card. Fill that out, either the physical one or the online one, and Put it in the basket in the lobby, and we'll follow up right away so we can make sure we help you with that, that next step. Thank you for being here for this dynamic finish to our That's What He Said series. We cannot wait to be together for the Be the Church series next Sunday. God bless. Have a great day. See you at Dad Fest.